first of all, I'd like to thank very much the organizers for their very kind invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here. And in fact, it's a double pleasure. First of all, because I spent many years with Swerf, as many of you know. And secondly, because uh, actually I spent six months visiting a Bocconi when I was writing my dissertation. Thank you very much to Mario, who's now left, who allowed me to sort of spend some time in an office free of charge. And, uh, I don't think that I would have been able to finish my thesis as effectively and as in such a timely way that I've not spent those six months here. Anyway, let me, let me start. Now, it was not supposed to be this way. During the Great Moderation, the economics profession believed that it had finally unlocked the secrets of the economy. Then came the Great Financial Crisis and the Great Recession. The near collapse of the financial system brought the economy to its knees and shattered the previous intellectual convictions. The Great Moderation had proved to be, at least in part, a great illusion. As the crisis broke out, central banks were up to the challenge. First, they pulled out all the stops to avoid another Great Depression. Then, they helped nurse the economy back to health. As other economies stepped aside, as other policies stepped aside. And having earned their spurs during the battle, central banks were conferred more powers in regulation and supervision, including in the new monetary uh, macroprudential frameworks, thereby reversing a trend that takes back to the adoption of inflation targeting. Today, economists have come a long way from the crisis. They have been close to or even beyond standard estimates for employment and price stability by equally standard definitions has been achieved. Yet, much is not well. Central banks have been running out of room for policy maneuver. Their balance sheets have grown to unprecedented levels. Interest rates have never been so low in nominal terms and never so negative for so long, uh, even in real terms. And nothing, there seems to be no end in sight. A key reason is that inflation has been stubbornly below targets in many economies, despite major central bank efforts to push it up. Moreover, debt, both private and public, is actually higher in relation to GDP than pre-crisis. Against this gap backdrop, central banks have been facing a triple challenge. Economic, by their own standards, they regard the low inflation as a problem, while the room for policy maneuver, as I said, has shrunk substantially. Intellectual, the previous compass has proved unreliable. Inflation has been not very much responsive to aggregate demand. Central banks know how to bring it down, but are less certain about how to push it up. And last but not least, and this is going to be the center of my presentation, institutional. Critics have questioned central banks' wisdom together with the value of their independence. In my presentation today, I would like to offer some personal reflections on these challenges and suggest a possible way forward. My main thesis is threefold. I will not mention the word populism, but you will see it very much in the background. First, paradoxically, Central banks' economic and intellectual challenges have taken root in the profound impact on inflation and the business cycle of the tectonic shifts that have yielded much of the economic gains since the early 1980s. That is, the globalization wave reflected in open trade and financial markets. These shifts also helped bring about stubbornly low inflation and disruptive financial cycles which vastly complicated central banks' pursuit of monetary and financial stability, retracing the experience of the first, first globalization wave that ended with the Great Depression. Second, the intellectual and political zeitgeist that supports globalization also supports central bank independence. Thus, as globalization has come under threat, central banks have been facing an institutional challenge to their independence, just as they did in the 1930s. And finally, while central bank independence and globalization are closely tied, there are specific steps that can be taken to safeguard this valuable institution. The step I would like to highlight is to reduce the growing expectations gap 
between what central banks are expected to deliver and what they can deliver. So the roadmap, I will first address the economic and intellectual challenge, I will then examine the institutional challenge, and then finally turn to some suggestions for a way forward. The historical phase that started in the early 1980s and gathered momentum thereafter has become known as the second globalization wave. The analogies with the first, which took place between roughly the 1870s until the First World War. And that, while faltering, survived until the 1930s when the Great Depression struck. Starting in the early 80s, financial markets were liberalized, both domestic and internationally, and with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the opening up of China and emerging market economies, the long march of trade liberalization took a major step forward. Some 1.7 billion people, 1.7 billion, something like 30% of the outstanding labor force, joined the global labor force. Paradoxically, while this globalization wave has been the source of much of the increased prosperity we have seen, it has also sprang challenges from unsuspected quarters as policy failed to adjust. Financial liberalization provided ample scope for unstable financial forces to take hold in the form of larger and more disruptive financial cycles, the most disruptive ones taking the form of medium term fluctuations in credit and property prices. Second, trade integration and the entry of new countries generated persistent disinflationary pressures through the convergence in unit labor costs with exchange rates not taking the brunt of the adjustment and through the loss of pricing power of both labor and firms as markets became more contestable. A phenomenon that has been amplified by faster technological innovation. Think of global value chains or of the substitution of capital for labor or of the so-called Amazon effect. And finally, <clears throat> by failing to adapt, prudential and monetary policies provided further fuel for disruptive financial cycles. Prudential countermeasures lagged behind, and a combination of a focus on near-term inflation stabilization and a progressive disregard for the behavior of monetary and credit aggregates meant that there was no reason to tighten monetary policy during financial booms as long as inflation remained low and stable. One clear and yet not fully recognized manifestation of these forces is how the nature of recessions has changed. Until the mid-1980s, a rise in inflation would induce central banks to tighten substantially, which in turn helped trigger the recession, while the fluctuations in credit and financial cycles were hardly there. Since then, a bust of a previous financial boom has coincided with a relatively stable inflation and a mild tightening of monetary policy. You could say that we have transitioned from inflation-induced to um, financial cycle-induced recession. And in recent research, we have found more formal supporting evidence. Since the mid-1980s, in a large set of advanced and emerging market economies, financial cycle indicators have performed the popular yield <coughs> curve as indicators of recession risk. I believe the similarities with economic fluctuations in the first globalization wave are no coincidence. Inflation was quite low and stable. Mild deflation until roughly 19, 1896 was followed by mild inflation thereafter. Financial cycle induced recessions were common, prudential regulation had not yet taken hold, and central banks followed a rather passive policy rule and did not restrain financial expansions. They kept interest rates roughly constant until the internal or external convertibility constraint came under pressure. It is precisely the combination of secular disinflationary pressure and larger financial cycles that explains central banks' current travails. Given the policy response, these forces contributed to the build-up of vulnerabilities ahead of the great financial crisis. Like any major crisis, this one ushered in a slow and prolonged recovery from a sharp downturn and the tailwinds of globalization and technology, which have helped central banks keep a lid on inflation pre-crisis, turn into strong headwinds post-crisis, complicating central banks' attempts to push inflation back to pre-crisis levels and progressively and drastically narrowing the policy rule for maneuver. 
Now this takes me to the institutional challenge. In such an environment, the economic whom intellectual challenge central banks have been facing has naturally gone hand in hand with an institutional one. Central bank independence has increasingly been questioned. And these criticisms create a challenge also for people like myself, who really value central bank independence. There are three sets of factors behind the institutional challenge. The first set has to do with policy measures. In the monetary sphere, 10 years after the crisis, emergency measures are still in place, with no obvious end in sight. And in fact, Mario was referring to that. Hence, two consequences. On the one hand, distributional considerations have come to the fore, being in terms of wealth or income, creditors and debtors, or the young and the old. On the other hand, the line between monetary policy and fiscal policy has become blurred. Critics have various expressed concerns about large monetization of deficits, given the large scale of government debt purchases, about credit allocation, as central banks have purchased private sector assets and subsidized banks, and about the huge increase in foreign currency reserves. Not so much in Europe, but in emerging market economies, unless you leave uh, uh, Switzerland out seen as a chest that could be used much more usefully, according to these critics, in other purposes. In the prudential sphere, the great financial crisis has resulted in central banks playing a bigger role in financial regulation and supervision. Detractors argue that the institution has become too powerful. The second set of factors has to do with policy outcomes. For one, despite having managed the crisis successfully, and despite having played a key role in stabilizing the economy, central banks have not fully avoided criticism. Some critics have focused on the bailing out of the financial sector. Others have argued that central banks have partly contributed to the crisis, be it in terms of monetary policy, but also in the supervisory, in the supervisory functions that they had before the crisis. In addition, some critics have argued that independence in, is now less valuable. Inflation has been conquered. The central banks are willingly providing governments with extraordinarily cheap finance. The third set of factors has to do with perceptions, and this is, I think, the most important. Since the great financial crisis, an expectations gap has grown between what central banks can deliver and what they are expected to deliver. Fine-tune inflation, take care of output and employment, avoid all recessions, and indeed for many, to be the prime engine of growth. This largely reflects that central banks have been the only game in town for too long, and also reflects a deep-seated and realistic view, to my mind, of how controllable economies really are. As a result, should growth falter, detractors will blame central banks. More generally, and this is the deeper factor, the sentiment against globalization and the elites considered its guardians and symbols has surged. Central banks are perceived as part of that cosmopolitan elite and as a leading group in defense of the status quo. A look at history indicates that the link between central bank independence and globalization is indeed quite tight. Many consider the first globalization era as the heyday of central bank independence. And as globalization fell under the blows of the Great Depression, central bank independence followed. Now, why such a link? Globalization and independence spring from the same intellectual and political fountainhead. That is, support for an open system in which countries adhere to the same principles and governments remain at arm's length from the market economy. Independence acts as both a signal of the adherence to those principles and as a mechanism to reassure markets of that adherence. Conversely, those intellectual and political strands that oppose globalization, be they from the historical left or the nationalistic right, tend to see little value in independence. This indicates, to me at least, that the link between central bank independence and inflation control is just of a more recent vintage. In the gold standard days, inflation was not a threat. More recently, the pursuit of price stability and central bank independence underpin it have played the same role 
as the pursuit of convertibility in the older days. One significant difference is the immediate reaction to the crisis. In the 1930s, central banks were often blamed for the slump, as they are still today, including by their fellow central bankers. In the case of the great financial crisis, and despite some criticism of their role, as I mentioned earlier, central banks were initially rightly held up as the saviors of the economy. And the open global economic order initially survived the shock remarkably well. But as the crisis legacy has lingered, and as the anti-globalization sentiment has grown, similar forces as those prevailing in the Great Depression aftermath have emerged. The deep link between central bank independence excuse me, can I drink a sip? Well, I can take it against them. The deep link between central bank independence and the political environment suggests that independent independence reflects more basic societal or at least political preferences and that its future is tied to the future of the current global open economic order. Now this is a sobering thought for those who, like me, believe that that order and central bank independence are valuable, as the evidence indeed indicates. Fundamentally, central bank independence is valuable because it raises the bar. It makes it harder for the governments of the day to pursue short-term objectives at the cost of long-term economic performance to take decisions for narrow electoral purposes rather than to look after society's long-term well-being. Central bank independence has a kind of option value, just like the independence of the judiciary or other government agencies. This also means that tensions between the government and the central bank should not be seen necessarily as a sign of central, of central bank independence failure. Rather, they are a sign that it is playing its role in finance lingo, that the option is being exercised. As the late Tommaso Palio Schioppa used to say about the Stability and Growth Pact, which again we discussed earlier, if no one complains, it means that the pact is not biting. Today, central bank independence is an option that is very much in the mind. Let me finally turn to suggestions for a way forward. Now, looking ahead, preserving an open multilateral economic order is a major collective task. At the same time, there are more modest steps that can be taken to safeguard independence. Now, how to do it is a sub-question of a more important one. How can central banks be most effective in promoting society's longer-term well-being? After all, central bank independence is a means to an end, not an end in itself. It is only worth preserving if granting it improves economic outcomes. This is the key to gaining and keeping legitimacy in the eyes of the public and the body politic. Has two implications. First of all, pure political economy considerations based on how central banks pursue their goals provide only a partial answer. There is no question, no question, that transparency and accountability are essential, but they cannot be the whole answer. Central banks have taken strides to improve both, but this has not prevented the current inimical wave of sentiment. What central banks do, arguably, matters even more than how they do it. Second, and if so, any answer requires taking a stand on central banks' best contribution to society's long-term well-being, which in turn calls for taking a stand on how the economy works, which as we know is a very thorny and controversial <coughs> So here, let me just give you some personal reflections. For starters, reflect, uh, restricting again the central bank mandate to price stability at the exclusion of financial stability is not a good idea. I fully understand the reasons for the proposal. Price stability is more easily measurable and thus better suited to support accountability. But the argument loses force, at least it seems to me, from the perspective of the what. As I have argued in detail elsewhere, price and financial stability are joined at the hip. They are fundamental properties to a well-functioning monetary system.
they're both ways of safeguarding the value of money, be it in the form of protection against default, against the erosion of purchasing power, or against a dysfunctional payment system. Unsurprisingly, central banks have always played a key role in financial stability. They did so during the gold standard, when they were the guardians of convertibility. They have done so in more recent times, when they have been guardians of price stability. Think in particular of lender of last resort functions, and in many countries, of their long-standing prudential responsibilities. In fact, the core arguments in favor of central bank independence in the context of price stability apply with equal, if not greater force, in the context of financial stability. This is true for the need to take a longer horizon. The lag between the build-up and crystallization of risks is longer than that between excess demand and inflation. Financial cycles are much longer than business cycles. And it is also true for the need to resist political economy pressures. There is hardly any constituency against the feeling of getting richer during a financial boom. In part reflecting these considerations, the principle of independence for supervisory authorities is enshrined in the core principles for effective supervision. What then are the more promising steps to safeguard financial independence? Let me mention three. Step one, make a clear distinction between crisis prevention and crisis management. Central bank independence is essentially crisis prevention, but it is neither desirable nor feasible in crisis management when solvency rather than just liquidity is at stake so that public money may be needed. It is worth thinking about how to put in place arrangements along these lines. Step two, make the price stability mandate more flexible. If globalization and technology have indeed played a key role in keeping inflation so low, the impact on output is benign. Indeed, there is considerable historical evidence indicating that price declines are typically not associated with weaker output performance, a sign that such supply-side factors have been at work. The Great Depression is a partial exception to that. The current deep-seated fear of falling prices is what Rajan has called the deflation bogeyman. Moreover, it could be argued that, as evidence suggests, at very low interest rate, uh, inflation rates, the underlying forces are structural. That is, the change, no, excuse me, the change in the general price level is mainly the residual of relative price changes. Now, if the underlying forces are structural, as I mentioned earlier, then these changes are hardly responsive to market policy. Under such conditions, strict targets may paradoxically undermine central bank independence by pushing central banks to adopt ever more extraordinary measures, running the risk of exhausting ammunition, and making it harder for the general public to support the push for a 2% target, regardless of circumstances. Moreover, as argued in detail elsewhere, greater flexibility would also allow central banks to better reconcile price with financial enhanced macroeconomic stability by employing the interest rate tool in support of macroprudential measures with a clear longer-term orientation. Indeed, central bank independence was put in place to help bring inflation down and keep it under control. Credibility is less likely to come in question if inflation is persistently low. Step three, above all, reduce the expectations gap between what central banks can deliver and what they are expected to deliver. Communication needs to make this point crystal clear. Sustainable growth requires a balanced mix of policies, not least structural ones. Unless central banks can manage expectations successfully, these expectations will come back, uh, will come back to bite them. Central bank credibility, independence and effectiveness would suffer. The question of the policy mix brings me to a thorny topical issue, which is the last one I'm going to address, which loom la looms large in the context of the need for fiscal policy and therefore some kind of coordination between monetary and fiscal policy. And that is the risk of fiscal dominance. Fiscal dominance de facto deprives monetary policy of its independence as it tightly constrains what the central bank can do. A common argument is that with monetary policy room for maneuver so narrow, 
The only way to boost output is to monetize deficits. This would work by putting money directly into people's pockets, especially if capital with a promise not to take it, that, not to tax that money back for a long time. The reasoning is common to a number of proposals, including pure forms of helicopter money, and a more constrained proposal, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, was put forward by BlackRock recently. The, um, I believe these arguments are analytically dubious and potentially harmful. So let me explain. It is well recognized that helicopter money, in its pure form, involves a promise never to tax the money back, so that expenditures are neither debt nor tax financed. What is less recognized is that this would require central banks to keep interest rates at zero forever. Helicopter money means printing money. In today's world, that means central banks operating with large excess reserves. As a result, lifting interest rates at some point would either call for paying interest on those reserves or putting a reserve requirement in place. Now, paying interest on reserves is equivalent to debt financing through the consolidated public sector balance sheet. And imposing a non-remunerated reserve requirement is equivalent to a tax. Not only is the prospect, therefore, of pure helicopter money unrealistic, it is hardly reassuring. The BlackRock proposal, a constrained version of helicopter money, raises slightly different issues. Here, the promise not to tax the money back and keep interest at zero lasts only for as long as inflation is below target. But why is monetary financing needed in the first place? For the public at large, it makes no difference whether it is the central bank or the government that is crediting their accounts. And with interest rates at zero, the government can finance itself as cheaply as the central bank, but it can do it at longer maturities, locking in the low cost. More broadly, these proposals expose the central bank to critical medium-term risks. Low for long interest rates raise financial stability risks over time, this will erode central banks' legitimacy. The proposal reinforces the expectation that central banks are more powerful than they really are. Central bank money has no magical power when interest rates are zero. And the proposals heighten the risk of fiscal dominance. Pure helicopter money is an extreme form. In the more constrained version, a quid pro quo could easily emerge. The government helps the central bank today, the central bank will help the government tomorrow by keeping costs low. After all, fiscal policy is always more powerful in such circumstances. Moreover, one can easily imagine the pressure on the central bank not to raise rates, especially if during the monetization phase, government debt has risen substantially, which is a kind of debt trap. Now, let me be clear. In the next downturn, monetary policy will need the helping hand from fiscal policy. As long as fiscal policy is wisely used, that is, is growth friendly and reversible, and where fiscal policy room for maneuver exists, which as we know is not everywhere. But deficit monetization as part of a coordinated strategy is not the answer. So let me conclude with one thought. The parallels between the two globalization waves are hard to miss. Then, as now, a phase of seemingly never-ending prosperity paved the way for a deep slump. Then, as now, a credit boom that ended badly led to a financial crisis. Then, as now, intellectual convictions crumbled along with the economy. That said, there are significant differences. So far, one full decade on, the open global economic order has faltered, but it has held up. The institutional fabric of society has seen threats, but it has survived. And central bank independence have come, has come under strain, but it has resisted. Now, there are steps that can be taken to support this valuable institution as part of the broader task of adjusting central bank policy. We have seen is a temporary setback or a temporary reprieve, and only time will tell.